throughout time, people across the world told each other tales of how they came to be, of heroes and monsters, romance and tragedy, death and rebirth. Mythology helped shape the ancient world, explaining the unexplainable. This is Mythology Unleashed. Far and away to the east, in the middle of the sea, was a mountain of fruits and flowers, the mystical Mount Wagwo. Atop the mountain was a boulder, seeped in the mystic energies of heaven and earth, and bathed in the light of the sun and the moon. From this boulder came a massive stone egg. One day, during the Zhao Dynasty, a stiff breeze caused the stone to crack, and from this stone egg hatched a large monkey. The monkey bowed to the four cardinal directions, began to walk and to leap, and from his eyes shot golden beams of light that pierced the clouds all the way to the kingdom of heaven. The August Jade Emperor was startled by the bright lights and sent out two gods, Thousand Mile Eye and Fine Ear, to investigate the origins of the mysterious light. The two gods reported to the Lord of the Heavens that the light source came from the monkey hatched from the stone. The Jade Emperor, upon realizing the humpleness of the light source, dismissed it from his mind. There was no reason to worry. Little by little, the monkey grew upon his mountain home, eating the fruits and flowers and playing with the other monkeys. One summer day, the monkey troop came to a cliff overlooking a large waterfall. A challenge was declared. Whosoever could force his way through the waterfall without suffering injury and discover its source would be the leader of the monkey troop. Fearlessly, the monkey from the stone leapt from the cliff and plunged into the roaring waters. He landed on the other side of the waterfall, drenched, but unharmed. With his triumph, the monkey hatched from the stone was declared the Monkey King. And so the Monkey King ruled the troop and their island home in endless bliss. Centuries later, the Monkey King began to feel solemn. He was courageous under circumstances that would rattle the bravest, but he was petrified at the idea of death. Or more precisely, his time on Earth coming to an end, for he loved life more than anything. Upon hearing his lamentations, one of his advisors informed him of the Buddhas who had learned the secrets of everlasting life. So the Monkey King built himself a raft and set forth for the world of mankind to learn the secrets of immortality. When he arrived at the shores of man, he stole the clothing of a woodsman and blended himself as best he could into human society. The Monkey King wandered his strange land for nine years, until one day he learned of a holy man who knew the way to eternal life, the venerated Master Subodhi. When he found Subodhi's dwelling, it was locked and he was nervous to knock. But before too long, one of Subodhi's disciples had welcomed the Monkey King inside. The Master knew in advance of Monkey's arrival. The Monkey King was made a pupil and given a new name, Sun the Enlightened One, Sun Wukong. Under Master Subodhi's tutelage, he learned the 72 methods of transformation and cloud somersaulting, allowing him to travel thousands of miles in a single leap. He was taught all manner of magical spells, traditional medicine, martial arts, and most importantly, an internal breathing method that would grant him immortality. After 20 years of learning from the wise master, 
Sun Wukong's time with Sabudi came to an end when he was caught shapeshifting into a pine tree before the other disciples as a means of showing off. With a heavy heart, Sun Wukong returned home, and he was sworn to secrecy of being Sabudi's student. Sun Wukong made his way back to Mount Waguo, but upon returning he discovered that a demon king had usurped his power, terrorizing the primate population of the island. Using the hairs from his body, Sun Wukong cloned himself into a monkey army and defeated the demon king, reclaiming his primal throne. Fearing for his subjects, Sun Wukong proceeded to train his followers in martial arts and armed them with weapons stolen from the forges of the Aulai capital. But now he was in need of a personal weapon, for any mortal made sword was too light for him. So he ventured forth into the Great Sea to meet with the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea. The Dragon King welcomed Sun Wukong and showed him his magnificent armory. But Sun Wukong was growing increasingly frustrated, for even the heaviest of weapons, weighing thousands of pounds, were as light as children's toys to him. Finally, the Dragon King and his family showed him a massive, nine-ton iron bar with golden clamps on either end. The as-you-wish gold-banded cudgel. At last, the Monkey King found a weapon heavy enough. Perhaps too heavy, he thought. But no sooner did he think this, the rod shrank to fit his ideal size. In fact, this magical rod could change size at his command from the size of a mountain to the size of a pin. Sun Wukong took the staff for himself and with no shortage of stubbornness, bullied the Dragon King and his family into giving him a golden suit of armor. When the Monkey King returned to his home, he dreamed that he was being taken to Diyu, the realm of the dead, by a pair of psychopomps. How could this be? He had learned the secrets of eternal life from Master Sabuti. He cannot die. His captors tried to restrain him, but Sun Wukong broke free of their grasp and pummeled them to dust. Sun Wukong's martial prowess frightened the denizens of Diyu so much that Yunlar Wang, ruler of the dead, begged him to halt his rampage. Sun ordered the ledger containing his information to be brought out, and he promptly crossed out his name and the names of all monkeys on earth. His soul returned to his body, and the Monkey King awoke, truly immortal now. Meanwhile in heaven, the Jade Emperor was assailed with complaints of Sun Wukong's behavior from the Dragon King and his family for hassling for armaments, to the Lord of Diu for sons interfering with his judgment. The Jade Emperor was about to order the Monkey King's arrest when the Evening Star stepped forth on Sun's behalf. Though he was roguish, greedy, and peerlessly determined, they had to remember that Sun Wukong was born from the purest of cosmic energies and was disciplined enough to learn the hidden knowledge of immortality. So it was decided that Sun Wukong would be brought to heaven and given a charge so as to be kept an eye on. The evening star descended to earth and relayed the news to Sun Wukong, who was made the marshal of the heavenly horses. Nearly two weeks later, at a feast, Sun Wukong learned that his position was menial and that he was not on equal terms with any of the other gods as he had thought. Enraged, Sun Wukong flipped over the table and in a somersault, he returned to his island. Ten years had passed in the mortal world and the primate island was overjoyed with the return of their monarch, whom they had referred to as the Great Sage who is Heaven's Equal. 
the Jade Emperor's patience was spent, and he sent Heaven's armies after the Monkey King. But Sun Wukong managed to defeat them all. Not even the fury of the god Nocha could best him in combat. Soon the Evening Star convinced the Jade Emperor to grant title to the mischievous primate, and promises of a life of pleasure in heaven. Naturally, Sun Wukong was appeased, and returned to heaven reveling in his triumph. For a time, Sun Wukong lived a life of leisure, eating and napping, showing little respect to the gods, but was staying out of trouble nonetheless. The Jade Emperor feared that this idleness would only lead to future mischief. So Sun was given the duty of guarding the Garden of Immortal Peaches, sacred to Shuang Mu, the Queen Mother of the West, whose trees bore fruit only once every few thousand years, and whose fruit conferred immortality on whosoever consumed it. He was forbidden from eating any of the peaches, but he could not resist the temptation and proceeded to eat all of the ripe peaches of the garden. After eating his fill, Sun Wukong laid in the canopy of a tree and fell fast asleep. Zhuang Miu was preparing the great peach banquet for all the gods of the heavens and sent out her fairies to the garden to collect the ripened peaches. Upon arrival, the fairies accidentally woke the Monkey King, agitating him. When they explained their purpose of their intrusion, he inquired if he was also invited to the banquet. When they told him no, Sun Wukong was angered and cast a spell that froze them in place. He then proceeded to disrupt the banquet preparations, consuming all of the celestial food and all of the immortal wine before drunkenly stumbling into the laboratory of Lao Tzu and ingesting the alchemically derived pills of immortality, increasing his invincibility exponentially. Knowing full well the wrath of the gods would soon be on him, Sun Wukong turned himself invisible and escaped through the western gate and back down to earth. News spread of the travesty, and the Jade Emperor sent the entire might of heaven down upon Sun Wukong. But as before, Sun Wukong's prowess in battle and magic kept the forces of heaven well at bay. When all seemed lost for the gods, the Jade Emperor's nephew, Arlong Shen, and his army of beast spirits joined the fray. Sun Wukong and Arlong battled viciously, nigh equals in both shapeshifting and martial arts. But Sun Wukong was defeated when Arlong Shen's celestial hound, Tian Ko, bit the monkey on his leg, distracting him long enough for Arlong and Lao Tzu to overcome him. He was bound, dragged back to heaven in order to be executed. But no method could kill the monkey, for Sun Wukong's teachings and his consumption of the immortal peaches, wine, and pills made him truly invulnerable. Even being trapped in Lao Tzu's magic oven for 49 days only seemed to make him stronger. So the Jade Emperor was forced to call on Buddha for aid. Buddha arrived with his disciples and was introduced to the troublesome Monkey King. Sun Wukong boasted his accomplishments and spat on the virtues of the Jade Emperor, claiming he was more worthy of the Heaven's Throne. So Buddha made Sun a wager. If he could somersault from out of his hand, then he would be free of all charges and granted Heaven's Throne. But if he failed, he must yield to Buddha's fetters. It seemed simple enough. So Sun Wukong jumped into Buddha's hand and somersaulted far and away. Amidst his jump, he saw five columns that towered to the sky. These must mark the ends of the earth. So Sun Wukong landed on one of the columns 
and left his mark as proof. When he returned to Buddha, he demanded his reward. But Buddha laughed at the cocky primate and told him he had never left his palm. Sun Wukong was shocked to see the mark he had left on the column was present upon Buddha's middle finger. Before he could escape, Buddha trapped him in his hand and cast him from heaven. Using the five elements of water, fire, wood, earth, and metal, Buddha sealed Sun Wukong beneath a mountain where he would have to wait until the gods would show him mercy. Sun Wukong remained imprisoned beneath the celestial mountain for centuries before he was released by a Buddhist monk, Tang San Zhang, dubbed Tripitaka by the goddess Guanyin, on the condition that he serve him as an escort in his journey to the west. Sun Wukong eventually conceded and went on to faithfully protect the monk on his journey. But that is a story for another time.